All right, we are right at one o'clock. So let's go ahead and get the series started. Um, so welcome to our third session of the Extension Master Gardener IDs and Diagnoses webinar series. Um, please remember that your mutes, mics are muted, um, but you can use the chat box to ask any questions of our speakers here this afternoon. And we'll get to as many of those at the end of their presentation as we can. The session today is being recorded and is going to be posted on our EMG webinar archive um, within the next few days. Um, so if you anybody you know you want to share the link with them, please feel free. If you've missed any of our earlier sessions uh, from the past two weeks, you can also find those recordings posted to, to the webinar archive. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Michael Flessner and Michael Green from the Weed Identification Clinic at Virginia Tech. We are so happy to have them join us for this webinar series and thank you for joining us. Great, well, I'm uh, Michael Flustner. I'm an extension weed specialist at uh, Virginia Tech. I've been here, I think in my seventh year now. Uh, and, and I sort of inherited the weed ID clinic when I started. Um, and that actually comes with a, a diagnostician. And so that uh, has gone through a few students over, over the years, but Michael Green is the current a PhD student uh, doing the, the diagnostic efforts there at the Weed ID Clinic. Um, so my uh, usual role is in the uh, extension specialist is focusing on our, our broad acre crops. So corn, soybeans, small grains, forages, uh, those types of things. And so I know a lot of questions we get for Weed ID are on the home ground side of things, which is certainly a, um, you know, a big part of Virginia and weed management in Virginia. So there are other specialists in addition to myself. Um, so Sean Askew is our turf weed specialist um, and Jeff Durr would be uh, sort of a specialty crops and home grounds uh, weed specialist as well. Um, and so the way the clinic actually functions is if we get a sample and we identify that and you request control information, we distribute it to the relevant extension specialist um, who, who works in that area. So. Uh, if you have questions about home grounds, I will attempt to answer those, but really uh, we need to be talking either to uh, Sean Askew or, or, or Jeff Durr a lot of times. But, um, but Michael and I, we're going to kind of tag team it, this, this session here, uh, and Michael is going to start off with uh, kind of going to what is this weed identification clinic, how does it work, and um, if you get you know, samples coming into the local uh, VCE office, what, um, what do we need to do about those to get those either to the clinic or preserve those so that they're in good shape when they get to the clinic. So um, after Waco goes, I'll kind of go into more weed identification and what resources we have uh, for that. So Waco, if you want to take it away. We'll do. Um, all right, hopefully you all can see my screen. Um, like you said, my name is Waco Green. I'm a uh, PhD student here at Virginia Tech and I've been um, kind of running the weed clinic for the past almost three years, so trying to figure it out. So we'll go into kind of how I'm gonna set this up. I wanna go into the purpose of the weed clinic. So what uh, our actual role is, how to submit samples and submitting you know good quality samples. Uh, I'll briefly go into the online submission system. Uh, that'll be more used, more used by your extension agents, but I'll just kind of touch on it so you have an idea. Um, some more stuff on the website and then some other resources that are out there for you. So the Virginia Weed Clinic, um, our goal is to identify plants and weedy plants and um, kind of everything. We do crops, lawns, pastures, rights of way, um, and even aquatics. And like uh, Dr. Flesner said, we also, if requested, we try to provide um, an effective measure of weed control. So the main thing that um, we try to stress here at the clinic is getting good um, quality samples so that we can make an accurate recommendation or ac accurate identification. Um, here are some of the main issues that we get with our samples. So um, if you have a weed problem and you want to identify it, you'll contact your extension agent um, and they'll help you take this sample generally. The biggest one that I often see is excess water. So um, really wet samples are just, they just don't keep well. Um, a lot of times, you know, you'll mail them out maybe on Thursday or Friday and we won't get them till the following week. So if there's any moisture in that, it really, um, 
uh, we can't really get a good identification a lot of times. Um, excess soil too, um, we don't see this one as much, but sometimes uh, if you just put a ton of soil in the bag or however you're sending it in, um, not enough plant tissue. Uh, this is a big one, especially for um, small plants or uh, ones where we don't have like a flower on it or something like that that helps us ID it. Um, it really helps to have as much as possible, especially with grasses. This really helps us out. Mix samples. This is often, um, we really see this a lot with lawns. Um, somebody will send in a sample of grasses um, and it'll be, you know, two or three different grass species in that sample. So um, a lot of times we'll get in a tall fescue sample, but it'll be mixed in with, you know, maybe some Bermuda grass or some other type of grass. Um, and it's hard for us to know, you know, what's the, what's the weed here? What's, what's the one that you're worried about and what are you trying to grow? Um, so it helps if you can just piece it out to one species, it really helps. Um, but if not, we do do our best to try to identify all species. And then really small stage plants or cotyledon, that young growth stage of plants. Um, whenever you just have one or two tiny little leaves on a newly emerged plant, um, it's really hard to get a good sample that stays in good shape uh, through the post office, um, but it's also harder to identify. So um, if you can let them grow out just a little bit, uh, it really helps us. And you get a better, more accurate identification. So just some uh, pictures here, for example, this here on the left. Um, obviously, you know, I'm not, I'm not good enough to tell what that is. I don't think most people are. Uh, so just, just way too much moisture, you know, just set it out, let it dry, then send it in, It'd be a lot better. Um, here on the right is a sample of grass with several different species in it, you know. Is it ryegrass in your Bermuda lawn or is it Bermuda in your rye lawn? So uh, that really helps us out to know what, what you're trying to grow here. Obviously, uh, if you can ship it as soon as possible, uh, that's best. Um, if you know it's going to be, you know, a Friday or Thursday that you can collect it, uh, it's usually better just to wait for the next week. Um, you know, assuming the plant will still be there, collect it then and then send it in. Um, no added water. So sometimes we get aquatic samples. Um, uh, it doesn't need to be in water. So it actually helps us out a lot more if they're dried, you know, placed out uh, paper towels or something like that and allow it to dry. Um, and then all the thing, all that you can gather from that plant uh, is the best. So if you can get leaves, stems, flowers are great, or seed heads, they're, that's the best. Um, so just as much information as we can get about the plant as possible will help us. Here are some examples of um, some really good plants that we've had send in. Uh, these are gonna be really easy for us to get a quick identification to you. Um, you see here on the left, we have, you know, big, tall, upright uh, velvet leaf plant here. You can see those fruiting structures. Flowers really help us. Um, they're often the key diagnostic we look at for this. Um, and just, you see the paper towels here, really helps preserve it. So this is the link to the uh, Weed Clinic website. Um, you can also just get this through, you know, Google searching Virginia Tech Weed Clinic. Um, so there's different permissions that you have within the weed clinic. Um, so you're a county extension agent. They'll usually have an extension administrative group. Uh, so they can actually fill out and submit clinic forms and they can see all the forms coming in through their county office. Um, so if you have a question about a particular order that you submitted through them, they'll be able to track that. Um, an extension member can fill out forms, but they can only see the ones that they've edited or submitted themselves. Um, an extension guest, which I believe some, some master groaners do have this, um, they can fill out and save clinic forms, but they can't submit them. So they can go in there and kind of do some of the back work for it, fill out the forms and save it. And then it's just up to the extension um, agent to submit it. We try our best to get everything identified within one week. Um, and Sometimes that may take longer because if it's a really kind of oddball sample or something, I run it over to the herbarium here at Virginia Tech. Um, we have a great uh, botanist that works there that helps me identify stuff. 
And then once I do the identification and I put it in, it's up to the weed specialist to make that control recommendation. So depending on what crop it's in, if it's in pastures or row crops, that will go to Dr. Flesner. Um, landscapes will go to Dr. Durr. So then it's on them to make that control recommendation. And most of them are pretty good about it. If there's ever a delay or anything like that, um, always shoot me an email and I'll try to remind them. Sometimes it can get, get lost in the emails. But we try to get that um, really quick. I know Dr. Flester is probably the best at it. He's always on there within a day. So certain, um, certain extension agents do have multiple county jurisdictions. Um, this doesn't really uh, apply to you guys as much. Um, but if you are a master gardener, maybe more than one counties, this can apply to you. Um, and then it's important to know that um, we do not have an aquatic weed specialist at this time. So with aquatic weeds, we'll, we'll often get an ID. We can identify them pretty accurately, um, but we don't have a extension specialist to make control recommendations. So sometimes we'll forward you to a, a nearby state with their control recommendations or Dr. Flesner, somebody can make um, kind of a recommendation, but we don't have a designated aquatic weed specialist. So I have more information on uh, extra instructions if anybody needs that for the site or any, I have more detailed information. I could, I'll be happy to go through it with you and take a look at it. Um, some reference books or identification websites if you uh, just wanna do your own weed hunting. Um, the University of Missouri has a really good online guide. It's actually, um, I use it a lot myself. You kind of go through and you set up um, you pick what crop you're in, what if it's a grass or a broadleaf, um, and it really has a very useful guide for that. Um, North Carolina State has a very good turf uh, ID guide online, and the Virginia Tech weed ID guide as well. I've got to plug our own website here. So here's some books, Weeds of the Northeast and Weeds of the South, that are actual uh, good hard, hard copy books if you want more information. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Flesner. If anybody has any questions for me regarding the Weed Clinic site or um, further instructions on submitting samples, uh, you can reach me here at uh, weichel at vt.edu or call the phone number here. Um, I'll be happy to get back in touch with you guys. I appreciate y'all having me. Now, hand it over to Dr. Flesner. I don't know if I want to wait to the end to do questions for this or. Um, I think I saw one question in there that was just sort of what, what do they get back, right? Do they get sort of just a general, this is a weed or not a weed or what do they, what do they get back, Michael? Generally, we, um, I try to identify it just a plant identification. So I don't, you know, I don't usually don't, if somebody's, I'll often get a sample and it'll say, I have this growing in my yard. Is this a weed? And, um, that all that really depends on you know what if you if you don't want it there then it's weed you know so i just try to identify the plant and then if you need a control recommendation pass it off but you will get a scientific name a common name and it'll tell you who identified it and then you'll also get the control recommendations as well on one uh, like a pdf yep. yeah. yeah we usually try to get it all the way to the species level mm -hmm. um sometimes that's not possible just depending on the weed that, that is sent in, um, or if it's, you know, if it's not flowering and we really need a flower to make a, a, a positive identification, you know, we might be able to get to like a genus level, but not the genus and species. So um, in those situations, you can always kind of like send another sample in later uh, after it's flowered, or um, if that satisfies uh, what you need, then, then we can go from there. Um, but yeah. So that's, that's a resource that's available if, you know, if you don't know what it is and the agent doesn't know what it is and we can send it in and um, figure it out for you. Were, th were there other questions? Let's see. We've got a question about the author for Weeds of the South and then also for the resources slide, Weichel, would you mind going back to that? Yes, sir. Yeah, I've got some more resources I'll share too. Um, awesome. I'll, I'll go through these um, comments as well in the chat box while Dr. Flesner is. 
Um, I was going to put some links in the um, chat right now here. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so those are our three different links. The, the top link there is to my lab's website where we've got sort of a, a curated list of weed ID resources there. Um, the second link is to our weed identification page uh, and app, and we'll look at that. And then there's the, the third one is um, the GROW, which is a getting rid of weeds. Uh, GROW IWM Integrated Weed Management has some identification resources that are I think are pretty good listed on their website. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess we'll just kind of keep those handy and I'll, I'll come back to those uh, here in just a second, but I might start sharing my screen now. Okay, so, um, so we'll get into to weed identification and control. I'll kind of just go through uh, my thoughts here. So as Michael mentioned, you know, what is a weed? Uh, if you don't like to plant there, then, then that's a weed, right? A plant that's, that's out of place. Um, in this particular photo, uh, that's miscanthus or Chinese silvergrass, and it's pretty widely planted as an ornamental there. And, you know, it, it makes some nice, maybe more attractive parking lot than if it was just uh, pavement there. But if you're trying to pull your car out around this thing and you can't see around it, right? Suddenly it it's uh, maybe a plant that you don't want right there, right? If you're trying to might get your car in an accident. Uh, certainly once it gets out and escapes and, and takes over somebody's uh, pasture here, this is in Lee County, far Southwest Virginia, uh, it's it's problematic, right? This is now reducing the, the grazable area of that, the utility of that, uh, maybe the aesthetics of it as well. So, you know, if it's a plant that you don't want there, then, then, <laughs> then that's a weed, right? Um, and if you're just going to remove it by hand, you know, do we really need to identify it? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but, you know, identifying it really helps you manage that weed. Um, it's really kind of a key requisite step you have to, to take to, to identify the weed, right? Because it's going to then enable you to know what type of life cycle it is. Is it an annual weed that reproduces by seed every year? Is it a perennial weed that has some kind of underground structure? There that it's that you have to either starve out or kill or dig out uh, to kill it, um, and then how's it how's it propagated, right? Which is uh, a lot of times linked to its life cycle. But there's perennials that are simple perennials that really don't spread uh, with underground structures, but they rely on seeds for spread. But to kill the, the weed there is going to be pretty difficult. So um, when we get into, like I said, I, I come from more of a looking at soybeans and corn and that kind of thing. So the competitiveness of it, is it reducing our yield? Certainly if we're gonna uh, go to Lowe's or Home Depot or the co-op and, and buy a herbicide, we wanna make sure we know what weed we're trying to target so that we know that that herbicide is actually going to, to kill it there. Uh, and that's true of any management tactic. We can say that about herbicides, but uh, some weeds we can control pretty well with tillage, uh, other weeds, not so much. So like Johnson grass is an example that trying to till out Johnson grass is gonna be pretty tough because it spreads by rhizomes and you'll probably end up making the infestation worse by spreading it around um, rather than uh, controlling it. So, um, so there's, there's a lot of things uh, we need to know about the weed in terms of effectively managing it that we, if we don't have an identification, uh, we're not gonna know. Okay, so how, what's I guess my approach to weed identification? Um, I would say that learning is, is really inefficient, right? When you're looking at weed identification, you've got to really look at the plant over and over and over again, memorize its traits, what it looks like, what it looks like in different habits, um, different growing conditions. And it really takes a lot of work. Um, and not that that can't be worthwhile, right? There's really no substitute for knowledge and experience. Um, but I think it, you know, my goal today is not to say make everybody a, a weed ID expert, but hopefully put in, uh, in front of you some resources that, that you can really use um, to, to become better at it. And then make sure everyone's familiar with some basic plant anatomy that really helps you use those resources uh, effectively. The other point I have up here is, is just to write it down. Um, I, I know when I get a call or uh, sometimes in an email or just a texted picture, there's really, sometimes there's very good context around that. You know, this is growing in 
uh, around my field edges and shady spots um, in the summer, right? And so then I can kind of narrow in, okay, something shade tolerant, probably uh, at least a warm season, you know, growing period type plant um, versus if you just get a blurry cell phone picture texted to you <laughs> and you're thinking this is might be like a tree uh, leaf and it's, you know, some kind of small herbaceous plant, there's just no context there. So, so writing down that context actually can be really helpful. And then, and then once you think you have the weed, you know, going back to that context and saying, okay, um, is this a uh, hen bit? Um, and does hen bit usually grow in this situation? All right. So it kind of does it, does it pass the smell test there? Okay. So what, uh, what's some helpful things we could know about plant anatomy uh, to, to help us utilize these resources? So We've got this table here, sort of almost always helpful, uh, sometimes helpful, and then just, eh, you know, doesn't doesn't really help that much uh, in terms of, I think, the basic weed ID. And I guess by that, I mean, um, there's, I don't know how many millions of plants out there. There's probably only about seven or 800 that are considered weeds that, you know, interfere with uh, uh, human activities in some form or fashion. Um, and, and then, of those, you know, there's like the really common ones, right? The ones we encounter quite a bit. Uh, when we get into like what Weichel does at the weed clinic, that's where like the flowers I think are really helpful because you get in these um, pretty academic botanical keys, you're trying to figure out between species. But um, for, I think most of our weeds, you know, focusing on some of these other structures is, is more helpful. All right, so uh, the leaf arrangement is really almost always helpful. And so that is either, um, that's what this column is on the, uh, the right here. So you can see um, this would be an example of an alternate leaf structure. So the, the leaves come off the stem at one point and then another point and then another point going up, up, the, um, up the stalk there. Let's see if I can, um, I don't know if I can annotate or not here, but anyway. Um, so that's, that's alternate leaf arrangement, then there's opposite leaf arrangement, which is what this is here, where leaves are coming off in pairs off the stem opposite of one another. There's world here, which you see the, the leaves are coming off just all around it at a node in the stem. And then we also, in our weed identification website, put rosette uh, in there. And that's really what you see a lot of plants are this time of year, it's these sort of wintering rosettes, and then they'll bolt up and put on their seed heads in the spring. Um, and so that's, that's a, another leaf arrangement that we have on our website. And, and putting in one of these will really start narrowing down the list of available weeds uh, pretty fast. Leaf structure is something I think it's, that's also helpful. Um, so leaf structure, is this a simple leaf, right? There's just one uh, leaf coming off that leaf stalk or the petiole, or are there multiple leaflets that comprise a leaf? Um, and so knowing, you know, is that kinately compound versus palmately compound uh, also will really help narrow down the list quite a bit there. Um, the leaf stock or the petiole, just is it present or absence, is also something that can really narrow down the list of weeds uh, pretty quick by using the, these types of websites. Um, and then there's there's sort of ones that, you know, presence or absence of thorns, uh, is the stem cross section a square versus, you know, mostly it's just round, um, a milky sap, or uh, which is what you can see here. Uh, the, these will there's not many plants that have these types of things, but they'll narrow down the list very quickly. And then last one of those is the ocrea, which is this structure. It's almost like a ligule on a grass, which, which we'll talk about in the next slide, but it's this kind of membranous um, tissue around where the, the leaf uh, petiole meets the stem. Um, and that's, uh, that's characteristic of, of one plant family in particular, the Pluginaceae family. And so, uh, if that's present, you've really narrowed down your, your list of potential weeds uh, quite a bit. Okay, then there's ones that are, are sometimes helpful. Um, and so like leaf shape is one of those. And, and the problem with leaf shape is, uh, you know, a, a round or an oval leaf <laughs> might look oval to you and maybe not so much oval, it might even look more like linear or lanceolate to somebody else, right? Uh, and, then, and then there's also this example of, plants that as they grow and develop, the leaves really takes different shapes. Here's, um, uh, which dock is that? That's um, uh, broadleaf dock here. 
Uh, and as brought at the at initially right now, it's going to be this rosette stage. And then when it bolts up, it, it puts on the seed head and you get these more linear leaves. All right. And so if you're looking all right, what, what would you call that? If you had a fully grown plant, would you call it the linear leaves or more of these oval shaped leaves? It's kind of tough. So sometimes the leaf shape isn't uh, too helpful. Uh, the leaf margin uh, can be helpful, uh, but then, you know, sometimes there's a distinction of if this is, is this serrated, you know, these kind of jaggedy edges, or is this like a toothed leaf edge, you know, so this, the semantics here can get kind of uh, cumbersome there, but certainly if it's a smooth or an, or an entire leaf edge versus something that's serrated or toothed, then that distinction uh, can be helpful. Um, a lot of times we focus on what's above ground but we forget about what's going on below ground uh, and digging up that plant to find, does it have perennial root structures can be really important. Um, if it's just, you know, over here, I've got this meh fibrous versus taproot. There's so many plants with fibrous roots and so many plants with tap roots that that's not so helpful, but if it has rhizomes or stolen or a bulb or a corm or some kind of perennial root structure, then, then that can really help narrow down the list quite a bit. Um, and growth habit kind of falls into that category too. There's a lot of plants as far as weeds go that are upright and non-woody. Um, and so that doesn't help you out very much. But if it's something prostrate or vining, uh, that, that can be useful. Uh, flower color um, is one that it's, it's tough to use sometimes because there's, there's so many flowers that have, that are yellow um, uh, and white. Uh, and then there's sort of always this sort of potential for a plant to actually be an albino specimen and then it'll have a white flower. Um, so, and then some flowers have, you know, they're, they're like blue in the middle or purple and then they're like white on the edge. And so what, what color would you call that? So, uh, so some of these things are more, more helpful than others. Um, but I might, uh, at this point, um, I'm gonna bring up our, uh, so if you go to the, the weed identification app here, there's uh, three different ways to use this. You can just type in a plant here um, and, and get to an answer. You can just look through all the plants that are in the database, either by common name or by, by scientific name here. Uh, or what I think is most useful is if you go to the plant type. And so if we just say, okay, we've got a, a broadleaf plant here, then we can start to uh, make some selections yeah. here. Yeah. Um, and so we, we've ordered these in to, and really try to put the what people are most familiar with at the top, um, not necessarily what's most helpful in reducing the list there. Uh, but so if you click on a uh, growth habit here, you'll see like upright and non-woody or prostrate, you know, along the ground and non-woody um, or something like a vine or a woody brush or stem. So we select vine and now we see that the list is really narrowed down. We had about 700 weeds in the database down to 39 pretty quick. Um, so we'll just click on this um, uh, leaf structure here. So this is where, uh, again, you have a simple leaf, just one leaf uh, on that petiole, or here's a, a trifoliate leaf. There's three different leaflets on this. And so if you're, if you're not familiar that the plants can have uh, compound leaves, then you might be calling this a leaf and you'd call that heart shaped. Uh, whereas, you know, it's really just part of a leaflet here. Um, so there's the trifoliate, there's pinnately compound, which are, which are coming off in that fashion versus palmately, which looks more like when you look at your hand, how your fingers come off your hand. That's how I remember it. Um, so if we click on, you know, one of these uh, pinnately compound, once the list gets uh, to few enough weeds, it'll show pictures if we have them. Um, and so then hopefully you're pretty close at this point. And so we just put in like two characteristics and got there uh, pretty fast. But then, um, so you can click on your weed of, of interest to just see some pictures. Okay, does this look like what I have in my hand or not? Um, and if you need to make those bigger, then you can click on it and really get a you know pretty um, pretty detailed image there of what we try to get on, on the website. Uh, so that's an example of, of the broadleaf weeds there. All right, so what about the, what I'm calling narrow leaf plant anatomy? And usually this is our grasses, right? But sometimes we have sedges as well that look like a grass, but 
are really in a different um, plant family altogether. Um, so what's helpful here and, and what's sort of sometimes helpful, um, the leaf uh, arrangement here is usually helpful and that's um, a little bit different than at least what we're calling on the website versus a broadleaf leaf arrangement. That's where they're either, they're folded in the bud and they kind of make like a V shape if you cut the, cut the grass off or they're rolled in the bud. Um, there's, there's good pictures on the website we'll look at. Um, what shape is the stem, particularly if it's triangular in shape? So if you cut off the stem and look at it in cross section, if it's triangular, that's going to be a sedge and not a grass. And so that can be uh, very useful and, and get you a long ways in terms of weed ID right, right off the bat. Um, the seed head for grasses is usually very helpful, um, <laughs> but we don't always have them, unfortunately. Uh, and then there's the, this um, oracles also. Helpful. And that's what's uh, over here. So not many grasses have an oracle. That's kind of this uh, clasping tissue that comes off the uh, from a leaf or it kind of wraps around the opposite side of the stem. Uh, but if a grass has those oracles, then that's uh, pretty, uh, pretty quick at limiting the list of possibilities there. Uh, and then again, the perennial root structures that have rhizomes or stolons, uh, that, that's really helpful uh, for grasses sometimes to, to narrow that list down. Uh, what's, what's, I think sometimes, I say sometimes helpful, but a lot of times you have to be looking at the ligule to uh, figure out what kind of grass is, but that's basically where the leaf meets the stem. They'll either be uh, a membranous ligule, a hairy ligule, or no ligule. Uh, and that's, that's something that can, can help you out there. And then, then you're looking at how tall is this thing? Um, does it have like hairs coming off of it? That kind of thing. And so that, that can be pretty tough to, um, tough to look at if you just have your naked eye. I really need either um, uh, a little hand lens to help you out um, or a dissecting microscope is what we have at the, at the weed clinic to help us out there. And certainly measuring those is kind of tough. So, you know, the, this is where like having a seed head I think is a little more preferable. You can say, okay, that's a hairy ligule and I'm not gonna worry about, about the length here, but you go back to, um, we'll go back here and look at what we have uh, for grasses. And so the, the hairiness and some other characteristics you see here uh, can be put in as well. Um, the leaf arrangements was the one I wanted to show. So here's the, the folded in the bud, right? So as, it's, as that leaf grows out of, the, um, out of that growing point, that terminal, it's gonna, be, it's gonna take this V shape and then kind of unfold as it matures versus a rolled in the bud. Uh, and that can, that can be helpful there as well. So that's, that's our website. Uh, like I mentioned, the Missouri, um, University of Missouri's Weed ID website, uh, it functions very similar, just um, different, a little bit different look to it. Uh, but that's one uh, I, I like to use as well uh, when I'm having trouble, because it really, those are, I think these kinds of websites are, are very helpful. Okay, so that gets us to the to the weed ID resources. Uh, I put these these three links uh, that you see in purple into the chat box a, a while ago. I see somebody just put in the, the Missouri weed ID link there. Um, so if we go to so pull up here, this is the list of uh, of weed ID websites or resources on my website here. So here's the the app we just talked about. Um, we've got information about the weed clinic that Michael presented. So um, this is sort of set up for you know anybody who comes along. And so if they're if they're wanting to submit to the weed ID, they need to find out where their local office is. So there's a link there for agents. This gets you to the login page, and then there's also uh, instructions here. Uh, so one of the things Michael talked about how to you know drying and pressing a sample, sending in that in. Uh, versus one that's soggy and wet uh, is, is all that kind of stuff uh, in those instructions there. Uh, and then there's a, a list of sort of other identification uh, sites that are out there. Um, so the other link I mentioned was, was this website. Um, and I think I had the, the lead ID link here. Uh, so this has a little bit more than what my website has on it. Um, there's these apps that we talked about, Missouri and Virginia Tech and Wisconsin has a weed ID key as well. Another question I get quite a bit is, is can I just you know, take a picture of this thing and, and have something identify it? Um, and 
So the University of Missouri, their website actually is also an app and that's what this ID reads is. Uh, Zarvio is like a BSF subsidiary that, that's, that has this. I think right now they're probably more focused on agronomic crops than, than home grounds. Um, but this iNatural has heard a lot of good things about um, in terms of, of being able to snap a picture and getting a, a pretty good weed ID. But I think, you know, for all these, you have to do your homework and, and kind of check them, make sure that they got it right. I wouldn't just go on or whatever it says, because sometimes uh, weeds can look alike. Keep scrolling down, there's, there's picture galleries too. Uh, and so on this website, we tended to list uh, universities as being more reputable sources of information versus uh, other things that are out there if you just Google different, um, you know, different things about weed identification. Uh, here's some of the books that Weichel mentioned. Uh, and so you can find, you know, all the, the author lists um, and the ISBN numbers if you want to order these. I think the Weeds of the Northeast would be the one I would recommend for Virginia uh, if you're just going to try to get your hand on one. Uh, but there's, you know, there's other Weeds of the South, Midwest, and the, and the West, um, and then some other resources there too. So hopefully, you know, you spend a little bit of time here and kind of find uh, something that works for you and, and something that, that you like. All right, so once we identify it, then it's sort of like, how do I kill it, right? <laughs> is what we want to do is get rid of weeds. Um, and so, you know, one thing, mechanical removal is, is almost always an option. Um, you, you know, if, I guess if you have a disability, but I'm thinking more of like uh, if it's uh, a weed that, that is poisonous, right? Poison ivy or uh, giant hogweed uh, would be one that you probably don't want to try to attempt mechanical removal of, at least not without proper personal protective equipment. Um, but a lot of cases, you know, you can just hand pull them up and it really kind of depends on who you're talking about, what they're comfortable with doing uh, and tailor the, the control recommendation to that. Um, but, you know, someone who's averse to pesticides then certainly mechanical removal is probably gonna be a part of that management strategy. Um, you know, once we identify it, consulting the pest management guide, uh, and so there's different ones there. There's the home grounds um, for, for like home lawns and, and landscape beds and gardens. Uh, the one I deal with mostly is the, the field crops pest management guide. Uh, and there's others as well. So, you know, once we've got identified, that's really going to have the best up to date information there. Uh, we update those annually and try to get all that information in there. And you've probably heard this from the other uh, diagnostic clinics as well. Uh, but if it's not in the pest management guide, I think it's really time to call the specialist or at least the agent to, to figure out, you know, what is this? Because if it's in there, if it's not in there, it's probably one that's not that common. Um, and it's one that might require, a, you know, greater depth of knowledge to try to figure out what the best way to kill it is. Um, and I would also just add this uh, organic note, you know, there's, there's these sprays out there that they're not necessarily safe to handle. Some of these you know, concentrated acetic acid uh, can definitely at least make your skin turn red and itchy, uh, if not uh, sometimes worse than that. Um, and so I think we got to trait on organic spray, just like any other pesticide and, and wear proper personal protective equipment. A lot of times they're not selective. Uh, so yeah, we can, we can kill weeds and plants with a lot of different chemicals, um, you know, before modern herbicides are pouring salt on railroads to keep uh, weeds from growing up uh, at kind of really excessive rates. Um, so, so some of these sprays are basically just desiccants. Uh, they're just gonna rupture the cell membrane and that the cell contents leak out and it dries down and, and kills it. Um, and it's gonna do that to both your lawn and your weed, right? So uh, they're not necessarily selective like some of our, our herbicides are that can be, be very useful for, for obvious reasons if they have selectivity. Um, they're not necessarily the cheapest option either. Uh, so, if, you know, budget's a, a category, um, then that would be something to consider. Um, and, you know, they're not necessarily effective. Um, these, these sprays that are work as desiccants don't really work if there's kind of woody or a hardened off tissue there. You can kill the green leaves pretty easily, but then you'll have new buds uh, re-sprout. And so it might take multiple treatments there, but that's true for, for any herbicide. Okay, um, I was gonna go through some of the common uh, weeds that, uh, that we see kind of right now and some other ones we get into the weed clinic here and then and we'll open it up uh, uh, for questions here. Um, so 
starting off with some winter annual weeds. These are ones you can, I think, go outside right now and probably find in the landscape pretty easily. The first one here is a common chickweed. Um, not really sure really what to say about this. It really can form these pretty dense mats. Um, it's nice and luscious green in these pictures, but uh, I guess don't let that fool you. These winter annuals, a lot of times, the, the harsher, you know, cold temperatures will kind of turn red or purple or yellow and don't look don't look nearly as, as healthy as these do. Um, but uh, but nonetheless, that's that is the weed. It does have a fairly um, I think unique flower there. If you look, if you can look closely at it or see some of the other pictures on our, our website there um, that can really help you identify it. But it's, it's pretty small, it forms these mats and pretty uh, ubiquitous uh, winter, winter annual here. Another one uh, or a couple of weeds here on the, the left is uh, henbit and the right is purple dead nettle. These are both in the same genus and really management of these is identical even though they are two different species. Um, and so they'll form these uh, purple kind of carpets out there that you'll see when you see these kind of dense patches of them out, certainly in fallow fields over the winter, but even in, in lawns, sometimes you can see that uh, happening. These are in the Laminaceae family or the mint family. And so they have this square stem. And so again, that's one of those things, if you, if you see that square stem in cross section, that can be really helpful and, and diagnostic here. Um, so this is actually I don't know if anybody remembers what this weed was from the last slide, but this is chickweed uh, with purple denial in it. So again, these are, are pretty pretty common weeds here. Uh, Shepherd's Purse uh, has uh, kind of a unique seed head here. It's kind of a heart-shaped uh, seed head there that, and these things get, I don't know, eight inches, 10 inches tall at the most, some, a lot of times uh, less than that. Um, but it just has this little winter rosette in the spring, it'll shoot up this uh, seed head. One that's pretty pretty common in the landscape. I think this actually could be pretty difficult to identify because there's just so many winter annual rosettes out there that until it shoots up and puts that that seed head on, it can be actually pretty challenging to identify. Harry Bittercrest is another one of these. Uh, the leaf shape is a little bit easier because of this this compound leaf on the rosette structure is a little bit easier to identify. Uh, this one's, I think, pretty cool because it forms these uh, silic seed pods that have explosive dehiscence. So if you're walking around um, enjoying like a nice first warm spring day and you're barefoot and you're, and you're walking through some of this, you can actually feel those seed pods will rupture and they just toss the seeds out at you. Um, it's kind of kind of cool there. So um, certainly I've got a lot of that uh, in my yard and, and around my uh, um landscape beds too here. I need to start getting on here before they get too big. I think this is my, my last winter annual. Uh, this is Persian speedwell. There's several different speedwells, corn speedwell and uh, bird's eye speedwell and, and others. Um, they, they all more or less have this kind of same flower shape, which you can't really see very well in these pictures, um, but they're all pretty kind of low growing prostrate weeds. Uh, they don't get enormous, but they can form pretty dense patches. And I think the speedwells are actually some of our tougher to control weeds as far as winter annuals go. Uh, the selective herbicides like 2,4-D and dicamba that's in a lot of our uh, like weed begone and stuff you can get over the counter at Lowe's and Hope Depot isn't as effective on these as, as maybe some of the others. So and then the last one here is, is annual bluegrass. And so are, are definitely the number one uh, weed of turf. Uh, not a very, you know, daunting thing as far in terms of size. It doesn't really get much bigger than maybe three inches across, but um, it would just go nuts as far as the number of ones that are out there. Okay, so some summer annual grasses. Um, I'm not going to go into maybe the more common ones like I did for winter annuals, but I want to go into the ones we're getting more into the to the weed clinic. Um, one of the things. Uh, I get questions about is, is foxtail species quite a bit. And so we actually have four foxtail species in Virginia. There's green, giant, and yellow, which are all annuals. And then there's, there's knot root foxtail. And if you dig up knot root foxtail, it's going to have this little perennial structure on it, thus the, the name knot root foxtail. Um, but if you don't dig this up, uh, you probably easily confuse it with yellow foxtail. Because uh, they look, uh, the above ground parts of that plant look very similar. But again, we're talking about management of these. The, the perennial, the managing that's a lot different than than the annual. So that's that's the foxtail there. 
but the foxtails, you know, if you have a seed head on them, it's pretty easy to get to foxtail pretty quick. Um, or bristle grass is another common name for them. I should say less common name, but um, but that's one that 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 we we'll, that we've been getting questions about. Uh, Japanese stilt grass is is another one that uh, it seems like it's just getting worse and worse every year. Uh, it likes the shaded kind of forest understory or forest, you know, shadowy areas that don't get full sun. Uh, but occasionally you will see it kind of creeping out into areas that, that do get more sun exposure. Um, it's got a really uh, wide leaf when it first comes up and you, you almost might think it looks like a chipweed here in this picture. Uh, but there's just so many of these plants uh, that have that like, kind of wide uh, seedling leaf when it comes out there. Um, but this is, this is an annual that really likes this kind of forest understory here. Uh, and it, it actually gets pretty big. It'll probably get kind of, I don't know, um, not, not up to your knee, but um, just short of it somewhere in there. Uh, it produces just massive amounts of seeds there. And then the, it, when it, the frost kills it, it just lays over and has this residue on, on the surface there. But one that is, is, is invading in Virginia I think it started in Maryland or Pennsylvania, the first infestation, but um, is, is wavy leaf basket grass. And this can sometimes look like um, Japanese stilt grass. Same kind of habit. It likes these forest understory shaded areas, uh, but you see this, this wavy leaf. Uh, sometimes stilt grass will kind of, you know, go up and down a little bit, but it's not waving at you the whole way down the leaf like this one is. Uh, again, the seed heads are, are really helpful here. These will stick to... Um, just about anything. And that's how it's uh, spreading so well as it gets on uh, boots and clothing and animal fur and those kinds of thing and, and hitches a ride and uh, finds a, a new home somewhere else. Joint head arthraxin is, is another one of these like warm season summer annual grasses that, that we're getting questions about. Um, it generally likes these more open sun areas. It has this uh, spike seed head. Uh, this is actually, um, a uh, large crabgrass seed head. Uh, so don't be confused with that one, but this more purpley red seed head, that's that's joint head arthraxin. It kind of likes these areas. Um, here's here's sort of another kind of wavy grass leaf, um, but the, the seed head is, is very much different uh, on, this, on this one. Another one that you can kind of sometimes get confused with these warm season grasses is deer tongue grass. This is a perennial grass. Uh, much different panicle shaped seed head here than, than the spikelets on the other ones. Um, but these, these leaves are actually, again, our scale can kind of help you here. These leaves can get up to like seven inches uh, long. So this is a pretty robust grass uh, in, in appearance there. And so, uh, but there is kind of some distinguishing characteristics here between joint head and deer tongue. Um, joint head doesn't really have like this, these hairs that you see in that red circle, I'm sorry, deer tongue doesn't have those and doesn't kind of come around the stem as much. It's not oracles, but it is kind of a leaf that, that wraps around the stem a little bit more on joint head uh, versus uh, deer tongue grass there. Okay, so what are some common uh, summer broadleaves we see? Uh, plantains, whether it's a uh, broadleaf plantain on the left here or a corner narrow leaf plantain on the right. But those are ones we see quite a bit, perennial weed. Uh, not that hard to control, but once they get a seed bank established, they will keep coming back from seeds uh, and they're perennial. And so once, um, once they get established, you really gotta, gotta get rid of them. And they don't, very, they don't hand pull very well. Ground ivy is another one uh, that we see it very commonly in lawns around Virginia. Um, it has, there's a, a couple of weeds that have uh, like a completely round, they don't have this notch in them, uh, leaf shape there, but I think ground ivy is fairly diagnostic when, when you see it there. Uh, bulbous buttercup is one that, that we'll see. I, I have this one in my yard and it, it flowers kind of all through the summer, uh, which doesn't seem quite right. So it could flower in the spring and then stop, but I don't know, Blacksburg, we have enough elevation where that, that's the case. There's several different buttercup species, but they all kind of have some version of this leaf shape. So once you kind of get that buttercup leaf shape in your head, uh, usually you can get to um, the buttercup or ranunculus species uh, pretty quick. And then it's just a matter of which one within that family, 
which can be pretty challenging actually, but I'm not sure that's actually necessary a lot of times because uh, management of these are pretty similar across the board and their sensitivity to, to herbicides here. But but bulbous buttercup, if you dig it up, there is a bulb-like structure under there. And so it's a, it's a perennial and it kind of forms these, you know, lots of stems coming out of that. Um, I'm just kind of skip here to the end in the, in the interest of time, but oxalis is one that, you know, it's got this trifoliate leaf shape. Uh, pretty commonly mistaken for clover sometimes, especially if that seed head's not out there, but it does have a um, really a kind of unique, like a little miniature okra looking uh, seed head on it. Um, actually, if you, you bite into this, it's all, it tastes sort of like a sweet tart. It's actually one of the weeds that I think is actually kind of tasty to eat. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop there and make sure we have plenty of time for questions and stuff. Um, and I'm going to put these resources pages back up. Um, so it looks like the chat box has been going nuts. So um, <laughs> maybe Kathleen, do you want to help uh, if there's questions? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. I've been keeping <laughs> And Weigel has done a great job of answering some directly in the chat box, which is helpful. So there's just a few that haven't been. Um, and a lot of the, um, the chat box was about connection issues and things like that. So if you have okay. connection issues today or audio issues, the recording will be posted in our EMG webinar archive um, just in the next few days. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then you can watch the whole thing um, without any issues, hopefully. Um, so one question is about the Virginia Tech weed database. Um, I think said something around 700 weeds are in there right now. Um, are more weeds planned to be added to that or are more added to that on a regular basis? So that's, that's something that kind of came out of the history of the weed clinic. Um, as we got new weeds, we would add them to the database. And so that's how it kind of got up to the number it is. There's a lot of plants that most people wouldn't consider a weed in there, but they came in and we identified them. So we added them. So there's, you know, there's like red oak is in there, but uh, most of those are, would be, you know, plants that we uh, would call weeds, uh, but we're not probably really other than if we get an oddball into the weed clinic, that's the only time we would add one to it. Um, more what we're working on right now is uh, getting photos um, and making sure, uh, I don't know, if you go through the website as often as I do, you're going to find a typo in there somewhere. And so trying to, to rid the website of those typos and, and make sure we have, uh, are getting more photos up there is, is kind of where our, our efforts are right now. Um, so, yep. Thanks. Um, next question is, uh, what can weeds in your lawn or garden tell you about the health of your soil? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good question and, and one that, that's always a little bit intriguing. Um, you know, one definition of weed I, I saw was just a, uh, it's just, you know, a, a, what was it? It's a, just a sort of a, what is willing to grow. Right. <laughs> and so maybe that's a reflection of, of what's in the, in the soil there. There's a, there's a few plants that are kind of indicator plants. Um, but a lot of times, you know, trying to identify what's going on in the soil by what's growing there is fraught with uh, danger and misinterpretation. I'd much rather see a soil test be taken and sent in than, than try to look at, okay, I've got, um, I don't know, what am I thinking of? Uh, you know, this this weed says uh, I, should, I need more phosphorus or something, you know, or this plant, um, something like that. I, I don't necessarily, a lot of, sometimes like, you know, moss is an indicator of low pH. Well, maybe, <laughs> it might just be a shady spot too, right? Where the grasses aren't as competitive. So that's, it's a, it's a you know, it's, it's an interesting kind of a thing to think about, but I, in terms of like, diagnosing your soil and what is actionable, I'd much rather get a soil test. Great. I think that's great advice. And if any, Steve Heckendorn in the uh, soils lab at, um, he joined us two weeks ago. And so you can listen to that recording and learn more about soil testing and how to do it, and why to do it. So thank you for that. Um, next question is about um, whether weeds, a lot of the weeds that you listed today, are they native to Virginia and kind of our region of the country or have they been introduced from other places? Um, a little bit of both, really. Um, it, 
don't know if I knew, know all of the ones which are, are native or not. Uh, they're all just sort of unwanted plants regardless, right? But certainly there's there's a hand or a good share of weeds that are just native to North America, right? Which would make sense. That's why they're, they're adapted to this area. Um, and then certainly the ones that have come from wherever they came from are probably adapted to a similar latitude and climate too. But, you know, that's one of the characteristics that makes weeds weeds right is sort of this ability to grow and compete and um you know <laughs> and and thrive in a lot of cases uh despite you know where other plants won't so uh, but yeah there's there is a little bit of information our pest management got on the origin of weeds uh that, that sheds some light into that so all right we're getting a lot of questions coming in, in the chat box um, so for someone from Virginia Beach, would you recommend weeds of the Northeast or weeds of the South? Mm, Virginia Beach is where I'd probably lean towards more towards weeds of the South. You know, you know just because you're getting more of that kind of Southeast climate uh, and, and therefore they have the weeds. A lot of the weeds in those two books overlap quite a bit, though. So um, I think either one would be a good option, but that I would, That'd be probably the one corner of Virginia where I think the weeds of the south is probably a better fit than, than the rest of Virginia where weeds of the northeast would be a better one. Thanks. Okay. Of the four types of foxtail you mentioned are present in Virginia, um, do you know if they are all dangerous for horses or other pasture animals? So um, the, the bristles on the seed heads can get stuck in the gums of horses. And, and to my knowledge, they are all um they can all cause that mechanical injury to horses. Um, there might be a species that's worse than, than others, but um, I, to my knowledge, they, they can all um, get, get stuck in the gums of horses, but I don't think it's as problematic for other pasture animals. Um, you'll hear about it like every now and then, I've heard about like those, those types of seed heads getting stuck in the fur of dogs and actually can kind of burrow themselves in and cause like a, a sore on, on the dog's skin, but um, I think that's more the exception to the rule. There's, there's plenty of foxtail out there and, and plenty of dogs out there. It's just not that common of a thing, but certainly the, the foxtail in a horse pasture can, can be problematic. All right. Um, another question is about the pollinator value of weeds. Can you talk a little, about, a little bit about that and kind of when weeds might be good to keep for their pollinator value versus when you might want to control yeah, so we always kind of talk about weeds in a negative sense, but there are some beneficial things of weeds and biodiversity and pollinator habitat is, is, is one of those things. Um, generally, when there's not many other things flowering in the landscape would be when you'd get the most value out of weeds as, as a pollinator um, uh, source. Uh, and so, you know, early in the spring, there's a lot of winter annual weeds that are starting to flower as, as the pollinators come out of the uh, hibernation and, and such or um, are hatching from from their eggs and stuff. So I, I would think that would be a time of year um, that that you would get a lot of value out of the weeds for pollinator habitat. Um, but yeah, whenever there's there's not a lot of flowering plants in the landscape would be ones that um, would be a time that I think they would have the most value. Great, thank you. Um, any thoughts on cover crops and their use in gardens um, to help smother weeds? Yeah, um, that's what I do in my garden. <laughs> so I, I really like it. Um, so I actually changed it up this year, but um, which is sort of complicated. But anyway, uh, I've grown cereal rye in my garden the last three or four years until this year uh, and use that as a um, basically just let it get as tall as I can, which of course, you know, uh, avid gardeners are always trying to chomp, chomp the bit and get out there as quick as we can. Um, and so uh, my wife's pushed me to maybe not let it get as big as I want it to get before we plant. But, um, but we just go out there, the kids and I will stomp all that down uh, to form a mat. And I spray it with uh, Roundup uh, to kill the, the cereal rye and whatever else is there and then come back and we'll plant a few days after that. Um, and so that residue really helps um, smother the weeds just like a mulch would in a flower bed. Uh, the more you can grow, the better it's going to do. Um, you do have to be concerned about um, nitrogen tie-up. So if you grow a big rye crop or any kind of grass, it's going to have a lot of carbon in it. 
So sometimes you can get a nitrogen deficiency. So um, we solve that by just obviously just fertilizing, right? So, um, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe I've got the wrong I approach, but in our, our little, ours, we're sort of limited on my garden where we have a lot of uh, shade in the yard. So we've got one little patch of yard that's sunny, try to grow as much as we can in there. And so we, uh, we just sling the fertilizer to it, <laughs> make sure we're not limited there. So, um, yeah, but I, I, I like that idea. What we're trying this year is I planted some clovers, uh, some white clover out there. And I'm going to try to have like a living, uh, mulch in there, which might actually have some, uh, pollinator habitat too. We'll see how well that works. The clover has not really taken off as, as good last fall as I was hoping to, but hopefully it's going to make up for it this spring. So we'll, we'll see how that one goes. It's a little bit of an experiment in progress, but uh, yeah, but I, I'm a big fan of cover crops. Uh, if you poke around on my website, you'll see a lot of our research in cover crops on use in, in soybeans and corn for weed suppression. So We had another question about um, whether the treatment and chemo chemical recommendations remain the same, regardless of the part of Virginia that that weed is coming from. So, so it, it, are your recommendations the same coming out of the weed, regardless of whether they're in south from Southwest Virginia versus the Eastern shore? No, we definitely take into account where it's coming from um, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, a lot of the, some of the information we would try to get in there is like what, like if you're just in a home lawn, well, that could be fescue uh, in, in a lot of Virginia, or it could be Bermuda grass, right? And the, what's labeled in those are technically two different crops, right? And so the, the herbicide options that are labeled there are quite, are quite different or can be quite different. Um, but then also like the time of year you might apply that treatment would vary quite a bit, right? So, um, you know, if you're in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, you may not get a pre-emergence out for your crabgrass out, you know, I'd say like April 1 would kind of be the cutoff or the target date versus if you're down in Virginia Beach, it's probably more like March 15th or, or maybe even earlier than that, right? So it, it, we do take that into account um, when that with that specialist making the control recommendation and it and definitely can vary. Great, thank you. Um, we've had a couple questions about control measures for specific plants that I think people see their um, lawns and gardens. Um, for those, I don't know if we need to go through all of them, but where can people go to find good recommendations for some of these um, weeds that they're finding in their lawn and garden? Yeah, so that's the, the pest management guides is really the best source of information. So that's uh, for home grounds, that would be, that would have the, the lawns in it as well. Um, I don't know that I have a link I can put in there very easily, but I can try to, I think if you just Google that, it should, should come up pretty easily in terms of Virginia Cooperative Extension Home Grounds Best Management Guide. Um, but that would be really the, the best place for all, you know, what we put into the pest management guides is stuff that we get all the time, right? And so chances are that's what you're dealing with too, because <laughs> that's what everyone's dealing with. And, um, and it's probably going to be covered in there. Great, thank you. Um, and it looks like some of those recommendations might be more for per acre rather than kind of at the home level. So what are your recommendations? Uh, someone gave the example of a concentrate for um, taking care of Japanese stilt grass for home gardeners. So Dr. Askew had had control for per acre, but not for like a home two gallon sprayer or something like that. So what do you recommend for helping people translate that to a smaller space? Yeah, so a lot of the turf recreation would be like per thousand square feet. <laughs> um, so that, you know, gets you instead of like 43,000 square feet, you know, you're, you're a lot smaller scale there. Um, but the, the herbicide products that are labeled for use on home grounds usually have something like that too, where they'll have it, they're not gonna label it, you know, like you're gonna go spray a hundred acre field. It's gonna have the, the doses is to, to mix up what you need for a much smaller scale. And so, uh, and, and sometimes, you know, you're basically, you're, you're doing like a broadcast, right? Where it's a certain amount of product per area of lawn in this case. Uh, but then sometimes you're just mixing up like a spot treatment, right? And you just spray the plant till it's wet and then you, you move on. Um, you really don't need to 
do more than that. So I think that's a fairly common homeowner mistake is I'm just going to soak it really good. And, <laughs> and once the plant's wet, you know, and stuff's dripping off of it, it's just products on the ground and, and it's just kind of wasting the product at that point. Um, you really just need to get it wet. And once it's kind of glistening and shiny, then, then move on. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, but so the, those, you know, mixing up like a two gallon backpack sprayer or like a handheld pump sprayer is going to be a lot different, but a lot of times that is on the label. Um, and I, like I said, I'm more familiar with the field of crops pest management guide than the home grounds, but I think a lot of times they have some of that in there too. Um, but there, there's probably also websites that'll do some of those conversions for you. Um, cause really that's all you're doing is just converting it. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see, there's a question about weeds growing in pots. So I think that's kind of when do you know when you spray versus when you can just kind of mechanically control and pull weeds. So there are certain weeds that you definitely shouldn't pull and should spray or the other way around. Yeah, I think whenever you've got um, like something that's uh, prostrate and spreading uh, and it's rooting at the nodes, pulling that's really going to be tough and probably ineffective because if you don't get every single one of those nodes, if it breaks off, well, that plant's, it's just another, now you have two plants where you had one, right? If you break, break that, that string of uh, the, the stem in, into two pieces. And so um, it's like Bermuda grass would be an example of, of that. Um, and, you know, some of the like ground ivy would be an example of, of one of those that I think really we're, we're spraying is going to be a lot more effective. But, you know, if it's just in like a, a window box, um, chances are it's probably something you can easily just pull right up uh, and out of the ground. Um, i trying to think of other examples. Um, I guess they've got a, a large perennial structure. So um, like dandelion would be a fairly common one that you can pull. Uh, but getting that tap root to come out um, of the ground in one piece without snapping off is, is pretty difficult to do. Um, I'm actually, I'm up in, in my bedroom now, but my, my usual home office has got had a dandelion right outside the window that I've pulled probably 10 times over the last, you know, season, and it still keeps coming back out, leafing up, because I'm not quite getting all of it. So if it's got those, those perennial structures or it's spreading, then I think spray is going to be uh, more effective there. Um, yep. Great. And I think for our final question today, um, we've had a question about, let me see if I can find it. Um, do you know the weather sheet mulching um, can help control Japanese stilt grass? So sheet mulching like plastic sheet over the ground or is that? Um, if not to clarify that question and exactly what you're thinking, that would be helpful. You can type that into the chat box. I'll say while that's going on, it's, it's really difficult to um, uh, see cardboard. Cardboard. Yeah. Um, I, you know, if you're preventing like light from getting down to the ground, um, then that when those wheat seeds germinate, right, at some point they got to have some light to keep going. But so it could be effective. I just, it's just such a, I don't know, it has so many seeds out in the ground that it's probably going to be hard to smother all of those. You know, it's probably going to come up through the cracks or joints there between those things. Um, that I think it would be, it'd be tough to do that at scale, but maybe at a small, you know, a small scale that, that could be effective. Um, it's one that's, it's pretty easy to kill with a lot of different, you know, our grass and herbicides and Roundup herbicides work pretty well. There's some pre-emergence options. It's not that hard to control with herbicides. It's just, it's just there's so many seeds out there that it just kind of keeps coming back through kind of whatever you do, <laughs> whether it's the, the sheet mulching or the herbicides. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think Sean Askew has a study out that it took them about five years of just no seed return allowed to, to get rid of an infestation of Japanese still grass. So that's kind of one that, um, you know, <laughs> sometimes we have to learn to live with. Maybe. <laughs> I wish, I wish we had, you know, I hate saying that as a weed specialist, but sometimes it's, these things are, are just really difficult to control and um, you put a lot of effort at them and still not be happy with it. And so it's just, they're just tough. 
I don't, I don't really have anything better to say. Now. I wish I did. Yeah, no, that's a that's a tough one, and I think it's becoming more more prevalent around Virginia. Um, okay, we've had a couple questions about pre-emergence um, that people can use. Is there anything? Anyone that you lean towards recommending for folks who might have weed issues, and then is that safe to use in vegetable gardens? Yeah, so um, the you know the weed and feed or the like the, the crabgrass preventer type products you can get it at like Lowe's and Home Depot and similar stores. Um, I don't know that I've got a strong preference for for those. I think they all work pretty well, um, and. and there's different active ingredients in some of those, but you know, they're, they, they all work pr fairly effective. I don't know if I've got like a, a favorite there. Um, I think like prodiamine based ones tend to work a little bit longer than pendimethalin based ones. Uh, but then there's also like that thiopyr and combinations of these. So it's kind of hard to really, for me, especially for someone that uh, this would be a better question for Sean to ask you, um, the, the turf specialist th than me, but you know, I found them all to be pretty effective as far as what's going on in, in my yard. But then the second part of that with the vegetables, um, vegetables are, are really tough because you're going to direct seed some vegetables, you're probably transplanting some vegetables, and they're all going to have different sensitivities to herbicides. And so that's where um, it's, it's kind of tough to do. Um, you know, if you're going to grow like sweet corn in a part of your garden, you can put out one pre-emergent herbicide and then maybe another one over here, but then you've got like you know, five or six different jugs of herbicides. So um, there's not like a, I think Daxol is a herbicide that is labeled in almost all vegetables, but the level of weed control you get from that is just too lousy for me to get excited about. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's, that's where uh, I think the uh, cover crop is really helpful or uh, just buying some hay and spreading that out or straw going have to be hay, but uh, straw would, would work as well there too, and, and just kind of smother the weeds that way um, is, is something I think is pretty helpful to do. All right, great. I think our final question for today, because I know we're running right up on 215, is um, is the Weed ID Clinic accepting uh, physical samples into the labs at this time? Is your lab fully staffed with COVID rec um, COVID um, going on yep. right now? Yeah, yeah, we um, we are, we're not maybe coming there every day, uh, but we're there often enough that we're still accepting samples. So uh, someone's there to open the door and the, the shipments are coming in. And so, yep, we're still accepting samples. Great. Well, thank you both very much for your time here this afternoon. We still appreciate you sharing with us about the Weed ID Clinic and, and all of your knowledge and expertise. It's been a, a wonderful hour and 15 minutes, and I hope all of our Extension Master Gardeners um, got to take away a lot of information that they'll be able to use um, throughout this spring, summer, and fall. Um, and thank you to all Master Gardeners who joined us here today. Um, remember, we have one more session in this series. Um, we'll be joined by the uh, members of the Plant Disease Clinic here next week, so next Tuesday at 1 p.m. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks for all the great questions. <laughs>